And I, you will never really hear me talk about politics, but I heard this, this speech and I heard the guy say, you're good people. I will not sit here and tell you or me that we're good people. I'm sorry. This is a church where we are sinners and we are broken. And the reason why our world the way it is is because we think we're good people. I'm going to follow my feelings. I'm going to do whatever I want. Church, and if you're what church, we need to wake up and realize that we're sinners and our sins should drive us here. Not that we're good and that's why we're here. I'm good and I don't need to greet people or other unbelievers. I'm a sinner saved by grace through faith and not of work, so I can't boast about it, but it's a gift from God, not of myself. We are not good people, I'm sorry. And I, can't, I cannot sit here and shepherd you well to say that we are. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up and turn to Genesis 27. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We have some of our ushers coming down. They'll be handing those out. So please raise your hand if you need a Bible. We have some Bibles coming down. It's going to be Genesis. That's the first book, 27. We've been in Genesis half of this year. We're halfway through the book. and um, It's been fun going through this as a church. So Genesis 27. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We have some coming out. If you don't have a Bible, please keep this. Please keep this as a gift from us to you and put your name in it, highlight in it, write down some prayer requests. And what's fun is later when you come back to it, you get to see how God answered those prayer requests and you can write down how it was answered. And so we want to teach this right here. One thing that we want here is we want to know the Word of God. We want to grow in the Word of God so we could go and share the Word of God. We want to know it, grow in it, and go tell it. And the only way to know the Word of God is if you have a personal relationship with Him. The Bible is not just a book to be learned, but it's to be lived. We know that when we live in this, this gets to live in us, and it shapes us into being disciple makers. And so we don't want to just open this and have head knowledge. We want this to hit our hearts so we could go out and live it out. Because you know why? We have a world that needs to know Jesus Christ. We're in a very broken and fallen world. I don't have to tell any of us that for us to know that. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to go outside and see that we need Jesus in our lives. And it's hard, though, for us to get there because we have a lot of pride. And we think that I'm good or I don't need it or that person needs it. No, we all need them. This is not a place for people that have their act together. This is a place for broken people that need to know that they need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. It's not a pastor. It's not, not a building. But it's Jesus Christ. So this is a place for the broken. A place for the sinners. And yes, we're all sinners, including this guy up here. And so we're going to read this family dynamic right now. We're continuing in Genesis. We had... Um, Isaac last week, and this week we're going to hear about uh, some more crazy family stuff. Uh, you're going to see none of them really trust each other, that there were favorites, and so for you in here, I think mom and dad have a favorite. Yes, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there are favorites that are being played. We saw this in Genesis 25. So if, if you can, just go to the left real quick. Let's just have a little backstory when we go into this, get in the context of what we're about to read. Genesis 25, we're going to start in verse 25. So Genesis 25 verse 25. It's just right to the left. And we're going to see the, the order of these two sons. These are twins. And we're going to see a little bit of the favoritism right here. It says this in Genesis 25, 25. It says, the first one came out red looking, covered with hair like a fur coat, and they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out grasping Esau's heel with his hand. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when they were born. So here you go. You got twins. You have Isaac and Jacob. And remember, their mom, her stomach was hurting when she had them. And she was wondering what's going on. And we learned that there are two nations that she was carrying. Two nations. They were already going to war right from the get-go. That was round one. Round two, he grabbed the heel, the heel snatcher, the deceiver. He's tripping him up. Round two, you have there. Round three, you had the deception that happened when Esau sold his birthright 
to his brother Jacob. I don't know if you guys remember that. It was a couple weeks ago. Is Jacob got his brother's birthright. And that was a big deal to keep the birthright. That was huge. This was your inheritance that was given to the firstborn son. And it was spiritual. And I shared how sometimes we have been given a spiritual inheritance to make sure that we uphold it, that we live it out. And it's something to take and hold on to, not lightly. But when Christ asks you to do something, we're, we're to do it. And for some of us in here, we're serving. We got to have, man, 20 leaders go up to camp and pour into the next generation. We had a kitchen crew that was up there providing meals for everyone. So people just have been saying yes. We have people that have been serving here, greeting people, coffee. So we could have coffee. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Uh, we got coffee, bagels, greeters, ushers. So you guys can have a Bible in your hands. We have people that are helping so we can have the AC in this place that have blown the patio for hours just so that it was a place that we could feel welcome. We have people that are on the prayer team that are praying at eight o'clock in another room just so that people can hear Jesus Christ. We have a safety team that is here so we can be safe. Isn't it amazing what, what happens behind the scenes when people just say yes to Jesus? We're able to come to a place where there's freedom and we're able to experience the love of Jesus. And so we've all been given a call and each and every one of us in here are created different to make a difference. And we're to use those gifts and talents for Jesus Christ. And so he sold his birthright. He didn't see it as a big deal. So that's round three. And now we're going to have round four. So they were favorites. But let's continue in verse 27. When the boys grew up, Esau became an expert hunter, an outdoorsman. But Jacob was a quiet man who stayed at home. Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for wild game. But Rebecca loved Jacob. So there you go. There's the family dynamic. They have, the dad loves his, his oldest boy, Esau, because he was a manly man. He was hairy, and he was, ugh. Kind of like, <laughs> when, my son, when my son Uriah was born, I shared this to you guys, he had these hairy shoulder, shoulder patches thing, and I was like, Esau? And then they, they, they shed off along the way, but... So Esau was this manly man that his dad was proud of. He could go hunt some game and make a great stew. And man, his probably hands were rough. And man, this is like, this guy's cool. He's a captain. And then you had Jacob, who was actually uh, hairless. He was a hairless little boy that liked to stay home with his mom. And uh, so mom really loved him. So you have a family dynamic and there's division. The and parents, here's the thing. The kids know if you're invested in them or not. Invest in your kids. Take time to have a date night with each and every one of them. Make, ask them how they're doing. They know the family dynamic. And so get to know them differently. Each one of them is different. They don't all think the same. They don't all feel the same. But here you have one that is completely opposite of the other. And there's the vision. So don't forget, not only was the birthright sold, but when the Lord appeared to their mom, they said the, young, or the older will serve the younger. Do you guys remember that? So they were told a promise that was going to happen, that the younger would be head over the older, which was unheard of back then as well, okay? So keep that in mind as we go into chapter 27. So let's go to this together as a church. It says this in Genesis 27, verse 1. When Isaac was old and his eyes were so weak that he could not see... He called his older son Esau and said to him, My son. And he answered, Here I am. He said, Look, I am old and do not know the day of my death. So now take your hunting gear, your quiver and bow, and go out in the field to hunt some game for me. I love, by the way, that he's admitting he's old. <laughs> he's, he's 137 at this point. <laughs> no kidding. Son, I'm old. Okay, Dad, what else? Okay. He said, so, go, so then make a delicious meal that I love and bring it to me to eat so that I can bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening to what Isaac said to his son Esau. So while Esau went to the field to hunt some game to bring in, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, listen, I heard your father talking with your brother Esau. He said, bring me game and make a delicious meal for me to eat so that I can bless you in the Lord's presence before I die. So let's just pause for a second. Do you guys see what's happening here? This is important to get the context. We're reading this verse by verse right here. Is we saw that the Lord said the younger will be head over the older. And what is Esau doing? He's putting it into his own hands. And he's saying, hey, son, don't tell anyone. Between me and you, go out and get the game that I like and I'll bless you. 
I'll give you the blessing, okay? Why? Because he probably doesn't want the younger son, this hairless guy that's living at home with his mom, to be the head. He's like, no, I want you. And so, listen, go out and hunt for me. We'll keep this between us, and we'll, I'll bless you. Let's, let's sneak this in here. It's, it's just a little lie. It's not, it's not a big deal. Have you guys ever thought that before? No one will find out. It's just a little lie. No one will know. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a blessing. It's, you're the firstborn. It's not a big deal. C.S. Lewis once said, a little lie is like a little pregnancy. <laughs> it grows, doesn't it? People find out. That's exactly what it is. And I want you to know, one of the biggest downfalls, I think in Christianity, but even with Christian pastors, is that thought. No one will know. We got to be held accountable, church. We've got to be held accountable for our actions and even when we mess up, which is why it's important for us to come together and be the church, which is why it's important to confess our sins to one another. There's no way anyone would come up here when we have a prayer team up here and they're going to say something and we're going to be like, oh, you struggle? That's weird. We're going to say, oh, thank you. You too, me too. Let's walk through this together. We're not meant to go through life alone. And what the devil loves, what the demons love, is for you and for me to keep things in the dark. He does not want things to come to light at all. And for some of us in here, we're holding on to things and we're thinking it's just a little white lie. It's just a little lie. But I'll tell you what, just like a pregnancy, that little lie, it grows. I know, I've lived it. And it grows and people find out. And some of us in here, we get tired because we're trying to keep up with all of them, aren't we? And the more it grows, you put your, your foot in your mouth or you're in this deep hole and it's hard to get out and God just says, just bring it to light. Come to me, I will give you rest. Now, it doesn't mean we're not gonna have consequences. There's still consequences for your actions. There's consequences for your lives. It doesn't mean I keep going and messing up. But what it means is, is if I'm to be like Christ, I wanna admit that I'm wrong because he never was, but I want him to do his work in me and I want other believers to see that I'm broken. I want other believers to see that I need a savior, that I'm not gonna be perfect. That when I say yes to Jesus, I'm not just this perfect guy that's walking around. I have all my problems solved. When I get baptized, it's not like, oh my goodness, finally all the demons have left me. No, we're still going to struggle. We're still going to mess up. But what's the point of all this? To bring glory to his name. That's the point. And I want you guys to see that in Genesis. What is the whole point of all this? To learn and know that the same mess ups that we have as sin are the same ones we have today. This is not an old book that we don't need to open up and read and study anymore, but this is to apply it to our lives because we struggle with the same thing. It's not like there's this old God back there and we have this new one and maybe, did God really say, did God, that's the, the enemy trying to play with our minds. It's the same God, same standards, same things, and we still mess up, we're broken. And right here you already see that he's saying, hey, listen, go do this. And now Rebecca, what's she doing? She's eavesdropping. She's saying, hey, you go do this, son. And by the way, I'm going to shatter our Sunday school mentality. These were not little boys at this time, Jacob and Esau. They were 77 years old, <laughs> living at home. <laughs> 77, and still being told what to do by their mommy and daddy. 77 years old. Isn't that crazy? Because what do we, we, we think that there were these young boys. and No, they were 77 at this time. And here's, here's Isaac. He's not knowing how much time he has. I don't know why he thinks he's dying. He's probably sick. His brother, his half-brother was this age when he died, about 137. So he might be thinking, this is it. But on my way out, listen, I need some stew. And I want to bless you and not your brother. And his mother says, hey, listen, this is what's happening. Now let's me and you. Let's, let's hatch something up right now. And so now let's, let's, let's look at verse 8. Now, my son, listen to me and do what I tell you. Remember, keep in mind, 77. Now apply that as we read this. You do what I tell you. Go to the flock and bring me two choice young goats, and I will make them into a delicious meal for your father, the kind he loves. Then take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. Jacob answered Rebekah, his mother, Look, my brother Esau is a hairy man, but I am a man with smooth skin. Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and bring a curse rather than a blessing on myself. His mother said to him, your curse be on me, my son. Just obey me and, get, and go get them for me. You know what I think is interesting in this is look at this in verse 12. 
Suppose my father touches me, then I will be revealed to him as a deceiver and will bring a curse rather than a blessing. I want you to see, what was he more concerned about? That he, oh, he'll find out I'm a deceiver. He's not even feeling guilty about what he's doing. It's more the fact that he'll get caught. We could do the same thing. We can mess up. We try to cover things up. And sometimes we just feel bad that we got caught. This is something that the Holy Spirit does in your life. It's called conviction. And the Holy Spirit will convict you to, to realize what is right and what is wrong. And when he convicts you, it should draw you towards the Lord, not, think, not scuffing it down and saying, oh, I don't need this, it's okay, I just got caught. I'll say, sorry, but I'll keep doing it. He's more worried about what will be revealed of what he's already doing. One of my favorite things about the sport of wrestling, I know I, I love talking about wrestling because I, I did that forever, but one of my favorite things is it's just me out on the mat. I will be revealed and exposed of the hard work that I put in. I cannot hide behind a helmet. I cannot hide behind anyone. I have to take accountability and actions for the work that I put in. And that's scary to go out on a wrestling mat in front of hundreds of people and they're going to see what you're really made out of. That's what it's going to be like before the Lord. You cannot hide behind your team. You cannot hide behind a pastor. You cannot hide behind the leader. You're going to be exposed for what you did with Jesus Christ. That should be a scary thought to some of us because some of us have been acting it for quite some time. We've been putting on this facade of what if someone finds out I'm doing this and that's more what I'm worried about than saying, no, I'm not going to do this. And even if in wrestling, if I worked my butt off, guess what? I still lose some of them. I don't always win. There's times the other guy's just better and that's okay. So even as a believer, you could try your best to do the right thing, the next right thing. You can try your best and you still may mess up, but you just look at tomorrow and say, I'm gonna live for the Lord tomorrow too. His grace, is His grace is sufficient enough for today. But I want you to see, he's more worried about what he'll look like than what he's actually doing. Don't look the part, guys. God wants your heart. He wants all of you, not just a piece of it. He wants every single door, every single key to every single compartment to your heart, not just a little space. He wants the whole thing. So let's continue here. She said, your curse be on me. Verse 14. So he went and got the goats and brought them to his mother. And his mother made the delicious food his father loved. Then Rebecca took the best clothes of her older son, Esau, which were in the house and had her younger son, Jacob, wear them. This is important. Why did she get his clothes? Because uh, you see that Isaac's blind. So why does, why does she care? You guys ready for this? You parents in here that have teenagers are going to totally understand this. The body odor. He smells like a gamer. He smells like a hunter. She knows that her baby boy has been home and he's just sitting there and he probably smells like Versace. It's very good. And then she has the older son that goes hunting who's in the woods all the time who doesn't smell that pleasant. So guess what? She's going to deceive even more and put his clothes on her son. Man, you want to know how Jacob learned how to deceive people? It is right here. He's learning from an expert. His mom. So not only is he saying, trust me, just be quiet, go do what you're told. I'm going to also, let's get his clothes. Let's step it up a notch. Let's get his clothes so that you smell like a man. You are, I am a man, mom. No, be quiet. <laughs> but I want you to see something is they're trying to get in the way of God's plan. This is a huge pattern that we see in the Old Testament is trying to get in the way of what God's plan is. And guess what, Christians? We do the same thing. I don't want to wait on God. I want to hurry up and get it done. But I, I see this. I want to get this done. It's hard to be patient and wait for the Lord, isn't it? Those dry seasons, we talked about this last week, that the famines that we could get in, it's, it's hard to wait. We want to get in the way and just get it done how we see it fit. But God is outside of time. He sees the whole scope. He's got a good plan for it. It's hard to wait. If, if he's saying to them, listen, the younger son will have the blessing. He'll serve over the, over the older. Why were they in a rush to get it done their way? You see this with Moses in Exodus. Moses knew, he knew that he was going to be the Savior. And what did he see? He wanted to step in because he saw an Egyptian messing with his people. So he steps in thinking, they need me. I'm the chosen one. And he kills an Egyptian. He thought, they will, they will need me. They will appoint me as their leader. And what did it do? It drove him away for 40 years. It backfired. The same thing with David, King David. He thought, I need to go rescue the ark and keep it on the cart and bring it back here. And we saw that there were people who were bringing the cart, the ark of the covenant, back 
And when it started to tip over, one of the guys touches it and he dies. Why? He thought, they, God needs me. News flash for every single one of us. God does not need you. He wants to use you. He doesn't need your money, but he wants to use you to glorify him. That's hard. I've been humbled in this way many times of trying to interrupt God's plan. I think of this story and I share this one a lot. When I uh, did travel softball for a while, I made this team. And when I made the team, they asked me, they had to interview me and asked what I did. And I said, I'm a pastor. And right away, I got so much flack. They said, Matt, don't try to save anyone on this team. And so I just wanted to live it out. Again, write this down, guys. This may, you may be the only Bible people ever read. So what version are they reading? So I decided to live out as a light. And there were these two guys I got really close with. One was the pitcher for our team and one was our second baseman. And I've tried over time, a year and a half goes by and I'm, I'm playing ball with these guys every weekend and I try to share the gospel with them and I'm thinking I'm gonna save them. Can anyone relate to that? I'm gonna save them. I'm the one they're gonna do it. Sometimes we stay in a relationship too long because we think we're the one that's gonna save them. And what, ha what happens? We drop our morals and we're like, no, it's okay, I'm gonna save them. I'll stick it, stick it out. And so uh, a time came when our pitcher, his mom passed away and he gave me a phone call and he wanted to talk to me about life and death. And I thought, here we go. This is it. This is the moment. Let me rewind to set the table for you guys. When I was a youth pastor, we had this curriculum and one of the, the, pass or one of the passages was to teach on the ice age. I did not care about the ice age. I never heard about it, but the movie with the woolly mammoth and the saber-toothed tiger, that's all I knew. I didn't want, so I went to my supervisor and I said, I'm not going to teach this. I'm going to put on an event because God needs me to do that. I need to put on an event and a lot of kids are going to come. My supervisor pushed back and said, I really think you should teach on the Ice Age. I think you're going to grow a lot. I think the students will like it. I said, I've never heard of this, nor has anyone ever asked me about this. It's okay. I'm going to do an event. Watch. So I made it about myself, but really God's going to use me in, in all this. So let's fast forward. I get to this place and my buddy in the second basement are talking to me about life and death and they start asking me about the earth and they start asking me these questions and then out of nowhere they said, Matt, if God is real, how do you explain the ice age? And I froze, no pun intended. <laughs> and I, I, I broke down and I, I blew it. And so I didn't have an answer for them and I just got to, I went to my car, I put my hands on the wheel and I said, I blew it. I had this flashback of how God readied me and prepared me for a conversation that was going to happen. He had the curriculum right in front of me. I said, I don't need this. I'm going to save. I'm going to do this. And God humbles you so quickly. Just let him use you. If you don't know the words to say, just tell him what he's done in your life. But let his plans work out. His plans are good. Mine aren't always good. But he had a plan, and they tried to rush it and step in. I want you to see there's going to be a lot of separation and calamity. It's going to happen. We try to step in. When we know the word, we know who he is, but we try to interrupt his will. It's never a good thing. So let's continue this in verse 16. She put the skins of the young goats on his hands and the smooth part on his neck. Then she handed the delicious food and the bread she had made to her son Jacob. When he came to his father, and he said, My father, and he answered, Here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob replied to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Please sit up and eat some of the game so that you may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How did you ever find it so quickly, my son? He replied, Because the Lord your God made it happen for me. This right here is what we call taking the Lord's name in vain. Using the Lord's name lightly. He's deceiving him. He's using the Lord's name as mockery. How many times have we done that? God told me I'm supposed to do this. God told me that you're supposed to do it. God told me, and we just sometimes say it because we weren't studying, we weren't prepped, or we weren't ready to go. And he's doing the same thing here, deceiving him. Oh, how did I get this? Uh, the Lord, your God, made it happen. It's just called using the Lord's name in vain. What I think is also interesting is that this was fast. He had to go out, get two goats, <laughs> skin them, drain the blood, stew them, <laughs> put them in, change his clothes, and he's like, how'd you do that so fast? And I complain at sitting in a fast through for a fast drive through for 30 seconds. And he's like, this is fast. Verse 21, then Isaac said to Jacob, please come closer so I could touch you, my son. Are you really my son Esau or not? So Jacob came closer to his father Isaac. When he touched him, he said, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. He did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like those of his brother Esau. 
So he blessed him. Again, he asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am. I want you to see something. He's hesitant, isn't he? Something is off. What is it that he recognized? The voice. But what did his feelings tell him? Wait, no, that can't be. He knew the voice. The voice was true, but his feelings led him a different way. Do we do the same thing with God in our lives? Do we do the same thing with this right here? You guys know the truth. The truth will set you free. That's right here. You have heard this, but our feelings totally drive us a different way sometimes. I feel God doesn't love me. I feel he's not answering my prayers. I feel that I'm all alone. I feel upset. That person said this to me. That person did that, and we go off of our feelings instead of faith. This right here is not changed. This will give you all the answers right here. But there's so many times that we read this, they're like, no, 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 but my feelings, because we live in a world that tells you to follow your heart. We live in a world that says that we are good people. And we want to stand by our feelings to justify our actions, to justify what we're doing. And church, I'm, I had a hard time this past week. We got back from camp, and I was in this room doing my quiet time on Thursday. And I, you will never really hear me talk about politics, but I heard this, this speech, and I heard the guy say, you're good people. And I was right here, and I started to break down. I will not sit here and tell you or me that we're good people. I'm sorry. This is a church where we are sinners and we are broken. And the reason why our world the way it is is because we think we're good people. I'm going to follow my feelings. I'm going to do whatever I want. Church, and if you're what church, we need to wake up and realize that we're sinners. And our sin should drive us here. Not that we're good and that's why we're here. I'm good and I don't need to greet people or other unbelievers. I'm a sinner saved by grace through faith and not of work. So I can't boast about it, but it's a gift from God. Not of myself. We are not good people. I'm sorry. And I, can't, I cannot sit here and shepherd you well to say that we are. The day is going to come where I'm going to pass away, and some of us may pass away. And I said this to our youth. I will be, even though I'm going to be in heaven rejoicing, I will be brokenhearted if what's said at my funeral is he's a good person. I don't think it get more shallow than that. I want people to say he loved Jesus. What else matters? Don't you let your feelings overcome your faith. Please. My feelings have led me in the wrong direction time and time and time again. You know who's never led me in the wrong direction? Jesus Christ. And you know what his direction is? Towards the cross. And that's going to sting. And it is hard. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that being a Christian is easy. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do. You are constantly going against the world. Constantly, every day, you are giving up your flesh and your sinful desires and what the world says is good, what the world says to follow. Live your truth. No, I want to live the truth. And I want you to see that it happened here and it still happens today. We know the voice of truth. You've heard the voice of truth and you have a decision of what you want to do with that. He heard the voice, he knows, but he's feeling everything and it led him a different direction. I had to share that with you guys because it was burning in my heart. I tried, it was, took everything within me not to post a video on anything. I don't even have social media and I was like, I'm gonna have it just for a second just so I could just tell people. We're not good people, America. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's why we need Jesus. If I was, yeah, no, thank you. If, if I was good and good enough, I wouldn't need Christ and I could get to heaven on my own, but I need him. He filled the gap so I could have a relationship with him because without him, I would go to hell, period. So let's continue. Verse 24, let's, let's bring it back. Again, he asked, are you really my son Esau? And he replied, I am, 25. Then he said, bring it closer to me and let me eat some of my son's game so that I can bless you. Jacob brought it closer to him and he ate 
He brought him wine and he drank. Look what else he did. Not only did he give him the food, he's deceiving with everything he also is giving him wine. So it clouds his judgment. Verse 26, then his father Isaac said to him, please come closer and kiss me, my son. So he came closer and kissed him. When Isaac smelled his clothes, he blessed him and said, ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. His answer, the mom knew. So he smelled him. He still was having a hard time. He's struggling. May God give to you from the dew of the sky and from the richness of the land an abundance of grain and new wine. May peoples serve you and nations bow in homage to you. Be master over your relatives. May your mother's sons bow in homage to you. Those who curse you will be cursed and those who bless you will be blessed. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had left the presence of his father Isaac, his brother Esau arrived from his hunting. He had also made some delicious food and brought it to his father. He said to his father, let my father get up and eat some of his son's game so that you may bless me. But his father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I am Esau, your firstborn son. You know, what's sad is that even when the truth is speaking to him then, he still said, who are you? I don't want any of us to have to live with that. When the truth speaks to you that you don't even know him, you say, who are you? Verse 33, Isaac began to tremble uncontrollably. Who was it then, he said, who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it all before you came in, and I blessed him. Indeed, he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me too, father. But he replied, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. So he said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? For he has cheated me twice now. He took my birthright and look, now he has taken my blessing. Then he said, haven't you saved a blessing for me? But Isaac answered Esau, look, I have made him a master over you, have given him all of his relatives as his servants and have sustained him with grain and new wine. What thing can I do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. And Esau wept loudly. His father Isaac answered him, Look, your dwelling place will be away from the richness of the land, away from the dew of the sky above. You will live by your sword and you will serve your brother. But when you rebel, you will break his yoke from your neck. That does not sound like a blessing at all, does it? Sounds like a curse. Bless me too. You know what's interesting is he said he deceived me for the blessing. And we see in Hebrews this one line of Isaac's faith because he blessed them and you would think that wait it was by deceit that he blessed them but where did the faith come in it doesn't say this but i have a i have a hunch that i wonder if isaac's faith was when he realized that he was deceived because he could easily have given them a blessing he could have done something but i think he realized wow god said this was going to happen and it happened just as he said that's the word of God for you. It happens just as he says. And I think as this conversation is going, and like I said, it doesn't say this, but this is just me. I think as it's going, he realized, oh my gosh, this, this blessing was going to happen. It did. Even in the midst of lies and deceit, God still worked it together for his plan to happen. He will do that in our lives too. And in all the chaos that goes around, his word will come to pass and will stand tall when everyone else falls. Just as he said it would happen, it did. Even if man tried to get in the way, God's will still played out. And it still will today. You will never be good enough to get to heaven. You cannot outsmart God. You cannot outrun God. You cannot uh, do anything that he will not reveal himself to you. There's one sin that he won't forgive. That's it. It's called blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And it's actually suppressing it, pushing it all the way away and rejecting it. That's it. He won't forgive that. You don't want to be with him. That's up to you. But he can forgive your sins. But Matt, what about this? But my feelings tell me I'm unforgivable. I know I live that. I live thinking no one could love me. I live thinking I've done so much wrong. No one can love me. 
But we heard what? John 3, 16, for God so loved the what? The world, that's you and that's me, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Romans 10, 8, and 9 says what? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Yes, he's come to you and he's come to me just as he said. And what is interesting is there's a foreshadowing. It's funny, someone was just telling me about this, about the prodigal son in this later on. But I want you to see that this came to pass. His father stuck it out. And I think this is where the faith was was finalized, was right here. We realized, wow, God said this was going to happen. Verse 41, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. When the words of her older son Esau were reported to, Je- to Rebekah, she summoned her younger son Jacob and said to him, Listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. So now, my son, listen to me. Flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. Do you guys remember him? He was in a couple chapters ago. And stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose you both in one day? So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hevite girls. If Jacob marries someone from around here like these Hevite girls, what good is my life? It's funny. Their morals are terrible, as as she's been deceiving this whole time. But why is she saying she doesn't want to lose two of her sons? Because... Esau wants to kill Jacob, and then by the law right that they had back then, he would also lose his life. And so I want you to see that when you try to interfere, when you try to be deceitful, it affects everyone. What seemed like, hey, just go hide for a few days, turned out to be years that she never saw her son again. I want you to know the Bible never even records that he got to see his mom ever again. Our decisions... Our lies, our sin, do not just impact us, but everyone around us. Like that little pregnancy. It starts off small, and you think it's innocent, you think it's cute, you think it's fun, and it grows into something, doesn't it? And it affects everyone that she never, as far as the Bible records, got to see her son again. But what I want to circle all this back to, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here, is this. Is he knew the voice and yet he stuck to his feelings and still tried to do his way and his plans and the mom tried to deceive how many of us in here have heard the voice of the lord have heard him calling to us and have still pushed it away because of our feelings thinking i'm not ready yet i'm not ready to submit to him yet i'm not willing to give my all them i'm not ready to take the next step because my feelings say i need to get my act together first My feelings say I need to join a Bible study first. My feelings say I need to uh, quit this habit that I have first. Did you know that Jesus came and died for you right where you're at right now? And every single person that he calls him, he says, come follow me. He doesn't say, hey, when you give this up, come follow me. He says, right now, come follow me. He'll change the desires of your heart. And so as they're up here, what I want to do is I'm going to pray for us. And if you feel led to come up here, if we could have our elders and our pastors and prayer team come up here. If there are things that you've been holding on to as you've heard the voice, maybe you've heard the Holy Spirit saying something to you, tapping you on the shoulder and saying, hey, confess this or bring this to light because he wants to do a work in you. He has his plan for you and it's good and he wants to use you. This is a time where we can allow him to use us. And if you need prayer for anything, come on up for prayer. We'd love to walk you through it. We'd love to pray for you. Even if you have a win of what God's done in your life, we'd love to celebrate that and pray with you here. What I'm excited about is there are students that have heard the voice and they've said yes to Jesus. There are students who have listened to, to the Holy Spirit and they're going to get baptized after this. Yeah, no, that's, that's amen, right? And so what I want, if you have said yes to Jesus, or if you're on the fence, and this is your time, today is the day of salvation, and it is going to be a tough journey. It is going to be hard when you get back out there, but we're here with you. We're here for you. We want to be there for you. We want to walk life with you. And so if you're on the fence and you want to just say, what do I got to do? Come up here. We'd love to pray for you. Even, here's this, I'll even do this. We, we can do this. Is even if you've never been baptized, you come get baptized today. You want to get baptized? You can get baptized today. What's the next step? How do I follow Christ? When you say yes to him, the next step you do is baptism. It's a, it's a public declaration of an inward decision that you made. It doesn't save you. Jesus Christ saves you, but it's the next step. 
Just like my wedding ring. When I put this on, I'm making an outward declaration I'm gonna be faithful and love my wife. That baptism is that, that wedding ring of saying I'm gonna be faithful and love Jesus Christ all the days of my life. When I take my ring off, it doesn't mean I'm not married anymore. But what it does is shows people the commitment that I've made. And if you've said yes to Jesus, it's time to show people the commitment that you've made and say, I'm all in. And I want people to know I've made this decision to follow Jesus. And it's the gospel. It's your first step to showing people the gospel. As you stand there in the water, this is us before Christ. And when we go down in the water, there's nothing magic about the water except it's been cleaned yesterday by some of our team. They go down and that's the blood of Jesus. It washes you, it makes you white as snow, cleanses you. And you rise again. You're a new creation. The old you is dead. The new you is alive. You know, it's cool. You're displaying the gospel to your friends, family, and strangers here. Who did, who did that? Jesus Christ. He died and he rose again. You get to share that with people. If you've never been baptized, I want to say today's the day. We'll have people over there. We're ready for you to get baptized. It's time for you not to push the voice away, but to say, okay, I'm ready. Don't be ashamed to think anything of it. This is your walk with the Lord. And so if you want to get baptized, we'll, we'll be ready for you. We have shirts for you and we'll, we'll get it done. And so during this time, if you want to come up here and ask for prayer, if you want to get baptized, let us know and we'll, we'll get it done. We want you to walk with the Lord. We want people to find Jesus and follow his call. So if that's you, we're ready for you. And Jesus has been ready for you with open arms. You are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. When he rose again, you can have freedom in him. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us. We thank you that he rose again. So you conquered death, our shame, our guilt, and our sin. It's left up on the cross, Lord. It's buried and gone. You've forgiven them, Lord. You've separated them as far as the east is from the west. If there's anyone in here, Lord, that's holding on to their shame and their guilt, I ask that they come lay it before your feet right now. And may you just be there with open arms like you, like you are all throughout the Bible. Help us to live out our faith, Lord, and not suppress it. Help us to take a stand and be bold in a world right now that just needs hope. And hope has a name, and his name is Jesus. So, Lord, continue to stir in the hearts of those that are here. Let us leave here changed. We love you, Lord, and praise you in your name. Amen.